Um, events like this aren't possible without sponsors. And I'd like to take this opportunity to extend a special thank you to, our, to today's uh, event sponsor, Pacific Power, and invite uh, SEDCOR board member Cooper Whitman from their team to say a few words. Cooper, if you could. There we go. Yeah, I'm Cooper Whitman, SEDCOR board member, uh, regional business manager with Pacific Power, focused mainly on the mid Willamette Valley. Um, I won't talk a ton about Pacific Power because we're a, you know, we're a utility. We, we have the same goals, I hope, as uh, other utilities and power utilities specifically in that we want to deliver uh, safe, reliable power to our communities so they can thrive. Uh, those thriving communities is where part of my job comes in. I see it as my job to uh, get Warren Buffett's money into rural Oregon, and uh, I can be pretty good at it. So that's what uh, that's what I focus a lot on. Uh, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to, to partner with SEDCOR uh, on this and tons of other things that we do with them uh, and to partner with a lot of you as we have in the past and I'm sure will in the future. But that's all the time I need. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Cooper, both for... Uh your sponsorship and for your commitment to support SEDCOR. Um, today, we're excited to bring a robust group of international trade professionals and local exporters with stories to share on the best kept secrets on local resources to help your business grow international sales. Let's all benefit today from their, from their, from their lessons learned, understand where to turn for trade related business needs and take down some notes preparing your company or those in your community for the next steps towards success in international markets. As this group has already shared informally, this is the first conversation for some of you um, that are going to lead to many more deeper conversations. So today is just a chance for all of us to put our toe in the water and understand and what is hopefully gonna to lead to further conversations for many of you. Please join me in welcoming Russ Monk, local manufacturer and district export council chair. Still on mute, Russ. There we go. Okay. I think we got her fixed. Can you hear me now? Yep. I'm, I'm Russell Monk. I'm Director of Operations and Co-Founder of High Impact Technologies, and I'm also the Chairman of the District Export Council. There's about 50 District Export Councils around the country, and we have the honor to work with the one based in Portland. It's for Oregon and Southwest Washington. In the District Export Council, it's a group of talented professionals, uh, heavy in the business side, that interfaces with the Department of Commerce with the intent of being that liaison, both going to and from the Department of Commerce of, of how to conduct business abroad. Um, in the local district uh, council, we have about 20 people um, from a broad swath of different uh, skills, uh, attorneys, uh, manufacturers, uh, different people that have great skills, heavy on the transportation teams and things like that. So the ability to uh, take Oregon slash uh, US goods abroad, uh, there's tremendous resources that are available um, the District Export Council being one of them, but the Department of Commerce, Small Business Administration, Ag, the state of Oregon has lovely team players that are involved in this, and the ability to bring all of that horsepower together. I, I found this as one of the better kept secrets of the federal and state governments, and we need to change that. So the idea was with SEDCOR and showing honor to them, I, I told them about what we're doing, and they immediately said, we need to get this broadened out to our team. And, and to our, our people that we work with. So I'm honored to introduce a number of talented people. We'll have Kelly uh, Holloway from the district, uh, or from the Commerce Department. She's the general manager based in Portland. We will have Alexa Beyer, who's state of Oregon economic development. We have uh, Teresa, Teresa uh, Yoki, Yoki Oka, I want to make sure I get that one right, from the ag side of the state of Oregon. Jim Newton from the Small Business Administration. And we have Bob's Red Mill uh, as a really talented exporter. And then I get to come back in as one of the customers of this group. Um, truly an honor to have everybody here. 
these are some great people and these are great resources that are you know geared for helping uh oregon and, and southwest washington companies be able to move their goods abroad and so i i will then hand it on to kelly holloway she's the uh, air traffic control with our commerce folks the the idea of this is also the ability to migrate ideas and and thoughts and concerns both to from the Commerce Department and to the Commerce Department. And so this, these talented people have the ability to move uh, these ideas and these products and these thoughts back and forth. So I hand it off to a, a great colleague, Kelly, and tag your it. Thanks, Russ. And thanks to Sedcor for, for hosting. It's, it's, I'm pleased to be here with my, my peers, my colleagues supporting all Oregon business on international matters. Um, as Russ said, I'm the director of the U.S. Commercial Service, the Department of Commerce office here in Portland, Oregon, and um, supporting uh, all sorts of uh, products and services um, outside of the ag arena uh, and helping companies find international markets and, and grow their sales. I'm gonna try and share my screen, uh, just a few slides, the who, what, where, why, how type of story. This is just a snapshot. Um, as, as we go along, please do uh, type in your questions as Michael had introduced and, and would love to address any specific uh, interests that you may have, you yourself as an exporting business or as a service provider or as an economic development official supporting your, your constituents. So the, um, the federal government uh, has our office uh, in Portland and about a hundred of us around the country. And we um, uh, are the local contacts for our network uh, around the world. And um, that network uh, staffs the commercial sections of US embassies and consulates. And it's really, um, you know, through that team and that feet on the street that we get into um, the, the local nuances of doing business in those particular countries. So uh, any corner, any pocket where you might have potential um, or you might have questions on how to do business, we have resources to tap into. And, how do we do this? I mean, we really do it uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So just like every business has unique products, unique service, unique experience, um, and, and, and you know, resources to dedicate towards international business development, so too are our approaches and, and strategies and, and counsel um, adjusted to, to fit that scenario. So this, this wheel of uh, support is designed to give you a sense of the scope of what that might be. Um, it could be export counseling, just getting started. It could be market intelligence gathering. I'm you know, looking at five different European countries, which one off offers the greatest potential. It could be due diligence um, uh, to vet a prospective overseas partner. Maybe you're looking to sign a new agent or dealer. Um, and so our teams can, can do background checks on those people and other you know, trade promotion and, and support. Um, you know, I think it's interesting to, to note that um, uh, more than half of all US companies that export to 10 or more countries across the United States, 90% of those are working with our agency, have tapped into embassy support at one way or another. You know, and that compares to um, a much smaller percentage of um, success that companies have where they haven't leveraged the resources at their disposal. Um, but why do we do this? Um, you know, it's all about jobs and economic development, right? If you're if you've diversified, you're selling in the United States and you grow internationally, then you can weather economic you know, ups and downs. But the truth of the matter is, is that the U.S. is underperforming relative to other countries. So as you can see from this chart here, only 12 percent of our GDP um, is generated through exports. If you look at a country like Germany, um, 47 percent. So we have a lot of room to grow. And, and the, the, the positive is that companies that do export are statistically proven to not only um, grow faster, but they're less likely to go out of business. 
Um, uh, less than 5% of US uh, small businesses uh, uh, that export sell to just one market. And so it makes sense if you're already dabbling in that, that you can tap into that 70% uh, of the world purchasing power, which is outside the United States, and turn that you know, one market of international sales into more. Um, the, uh, we do this um, all the time, every day. Um, uh, we answer questions from the most basic, you know, what's the, what's the import duty of a, of a particular country to very, you know, complex, sophisticated needs relative to sanctions and, um, you know, joint venture practices and things like that. So there's a huge spectrum. But this slide here, what this shows is just uh, over the last few years. The number of companies that um, we have worked with and consulted with across the state, you know, taking thousands of, of inquiries uh, from our small team and they're reporting success, right? 88 million um, in sales linked to some of the projects that we are engaged with in, in those uh, with those companies. And the map is just relative to all the businesses that we're serving. So statewide. Um, and a little small note there that I, I think is definitely worth bragging rights is that for every dollar that comes to our agency, um, um, because we are federally funded, um, we return $360 to the U.S. economy. Um, in Oregon, that, this is what this looks like. That's how many companies we're helping. That's where they are. Um, and this state is growing in exports. Um, about one in five jobs are tied to exports. And you know, in the greater Portland area, just as an example, it's the 10th largest metro area in the United States for exports. So there's, there's much capacity for growth. Um, we're here to help. And I'd love to find out what your needs are and then point you to some of our services um, that can help meet those needs. And then um, this slide, and I know it's gonna be streamed and circulated and saved, uh, so I won't hold it here long, but this is how you can find us. Um, newsletters, Twitter feeds, and it, you can stay abreast of uh, upcoming opportunities that are particularly um, relevant to your company. I'm gonna stop sharing, and hopefully that did the thing and turn it back over to Russ to bring on our next speaker. So in addition to the federal response with the Department of Commerce and all the talented people, the state of Oregon has a team that, that I love to interface with as well. Alexa Beyer, uh, we've actually worked probably, I wanna say 12 years with her and her department on the, the ability to use state funds and state programs and state resources uh, to, to go in. So Alexa, take your it. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for having me here today. Really appreciate it. I'm gonna share my screen as well. Hopefully you can see this. Is that showing up? We're good? Thank you. So, um, as Russ mentioned, I'm Alexa Byers, Global Trade Specialist with Business Oregon. We're the state of Oregon's economic development agency. Um, we have within our small agency, a team of export professionals and recruitment folks who bring businesses to Oregon. So I'm one of the global trade specialists. We just hired two, uh, two new global trade specialists to the team. So we're, we're up and running and super busy and ready to help out. Uh, today, I'm gonna focus on the um, Export Promotion Program and let you know about that. It's a wonderful grant program to help small businesses across the state with their export market development. We have two funding sources. Uh, we, um, we use uh, SBA step grant money uh, to help with export market development. And we also have Oregon Lottery money. Um, and they both go into one one big pot that we, um, we utilize, so you don't really need to worry about which funding source you're using. But if you uh, just remember the Export Promotion Program and um, uh, look for that on our website, and I'll get to that in a few. But the main thing is, uh, in order to qualify for export grant funding, you just need to be um, a small size business based in Oregon, not owing taxes, uh, employing Oregonians, 
and making growing or processing something here in the state or providing a service with Oregon employees. And uh, the, the funding that we offer covers up to 75% of eligible expenses and you can um, apply for up to $10,000 and you may come in to the program up to three times a year. So that's 30,000 potential uh, extra dollars in your bottom line each year if you utilize the program. And we have about 140 to 160 companies or so that come into the program every year in Oregon um, to use this to help them grow their sales. Um, I'll go over some of the eligible expenses too uh, with the program. A lot of companies use the funding for trade missions and trade shows. Most of those international shows are held outside of the United States. We really want to encourage businesses to get out there. Um, you know, when they feel comfortable traveling these days, it's really important to get to know the culture and the market and meet, meet international buyers in person on their turf if possible. Uh, lately, we've been doing uh, quite a few virtual events and working with uh, Kelly and her team and others to help, um, you know, with the Zoom format and whatnot. So we envision sort of a hybrid approach moving forward. Uh, the services that, um, that are provided by the U.S. Commercial Service, they may charge a fee and those fees are eligible under the grant program. Market research is eligible. Um, some of these uh, other expenses that we've seen an uptick in lately include uh, website translation work and website localization. So um, uh, a lot of businesses here in Oregon don't know that their international website, their World Wide Web site is not necessarily seen in other countries uh, like it is here. So it's, it's a good idea for businesses to, to lock down their website in the countries that they're super interested in pursuing, and we can help you through that process. If your product needs uh, special testing or you need to redesign your product and uh, maybe go through CE mark compliance or other, other standards uh, to get into another market, we can help you pay for that. Cybersecurity, this is kind of a new, um, a new line item that we're able to cover for companies that are targeting international markets. And the latest and greatest item we've added to the list of eligible expenses um, is the XM Bank insurance premium fees. If you do use export credit insurance, we can talk about that later, um, the fees are eligible at 75% reimbursement. So lots of uh, different ways to use the program. It's super easy to apply. You just go to our website, look for um, export grant funding. Uh, you can apply anytime during the year, but just make sure you apply before you spend the money. Uh, we do need to issue um, an agreement that you need to sign ahead of time. So just give us a, a few, at least a few weeks notice or preferably a couple of months notice is even better. We don't charge any fees for applying for the, for the grant program. So it's very easy to do. And um, we do look for results at the end of the day. That's really what we're after. Sales and new agreements, new partnerships that you may be able to make as a result. Um, this is our team, and you may contact any one of us, and uh, we'll get you to the right, right person on the team. We'd love to chat with you and learn more about your business. And with that, I thank you again, and I'll turn it back to Russ. Thank you. I'm proud to say that we revamped our website uh, in the last year and a half. Uh, to key on international markets, and they help pay about 75% of the cost to do that, uh, which was enabling for a small business uh, to be able to make that jump. So thank you to Alexa and her team for that. Um, so not to be outdone by the commerce or the, the business side, we have the egg side, and uh, Teresa Yoshioka is, is the, joining us. 
uh, with her blackberries in, in tow. And, uh, you know, the egg side, Oregon, you know, 90% of the wheat that's produced in Oregon is shipped out of Oregon. And egg is a critical part of our economy of the region. So I'd like to jump in. And there's there's programs that the egg brings that, that is a complement to all of them. So fire away, if you would, please, Teresa. All right, Tag. Well, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you to U.S. Commerce and Zedcor and all the partners for inviting me here today. It's wonderful to speak to you. Pull up my slides quickly and hold on a sec. There we go. Okay, sorry for the pause there. Okay, just kind of focusing on what our team does, the Oregon Department of Agriculture is a partner that does kind of two things. We are the regulatory agency for all food and ag and related um, sectors, but we are also an economic development entity. So that's one of the unique things about our agency is we, we cover both sides of it. Um, we, I am part of the small but mighty ag marketing and development team, which does the economic development. And we work everything from local to national to export for food and ag companies in the state. I'm from the international side. And although we, when we look at the consumers of our food and ag products from the state of Oregon, we have to remember that most of the population and thus most of the consumers in the nation are outside of Oregon. And honestly, most of the population and customers are outside of the United States. Oregon sells a lot to our international partners, both those connected to us as we think of our neighbors, Canada and Mexico, but those we don't always think about, but our neighbors to the West are Asia. And those markets are some of our top markets. In fact, some of them are our top markets. So Japan, Korea, China, Taiwan, those are all very big markets. A lot of it is wheat, um, but we are selling a lot of other products into those markets, frozen berries, uh, many important ingredients going in there. Um, and our agency is happy to help um, all of our partners in this area. Um, looking, let me just... And I know this is kind of a set of pretty dense slides, but this is really where we're focused on helping is upfront when you're thinking about going into an international market, you're gonna to wanna to do some research in the market. We can pull research, uh, information from trade databases of what's going there now. We can tap into and connect you with the reports, much like what the US Commerce has USDA has an entirely similar kind of organization in each of the consulates and embassies around the world, or many of them, where there is a USDA foreign ag service team. And they're all about the food and ag products. And they write reports about what the market's looking like, how to the exporter guide, all those things are available and we can connect you to them. Those are really important resources. So we bring partners together to provide the resources to this sector. Um, we can also do some trade consulting, especially since some of us spend a little bit extra time in certain markets, or at least we used to, and are familiar with it. Um, we also, because we have the regulatory side of our agency, we can do a lot more on the market access side of things. And with food and ag, that's a little bit more sensitive getting your ingredients in or understanding which ingredients are allowed. That's a really um, important part of exporting food and ag into those markets. So we can help with that. We pull in USDA appropriate agencies, whether it's foreign ag or some other, to really help give guidance on what can go in, what you need to do, what um, the processes might be. And then if, we, we hate to hear about this, but if products get hung up in a port over there, we can also reach out to the foreign ag service team and, and work to hopefully resolve that. Um, once you've figured out where your 
going from the market research, a lot of our energy is focused on making connections. Uh, this is heavily in partnership with Wasada. So through them, there's a lot of federal funding. And we bring in buyer groups into Oregon every year. I think we have about five of them planned to come in this summer from Latin America, Mexico, Canada, uh, Japan, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia. So we're very excited about bringing those things to companies. We also take through Wasada, take groups overseas, um, just bringing a lot of resources. The other thing is, is because our agency's director is on the board for Wasada, we actually have a really tight connection with them as an important program, not only for the work I do in helping with bringing buyers into Oregon or taking Oregon food ag companies overseas, but they have up to $300,000 of funding that is available for a company to spend in a market to promote their food and ag products. And finally, I mentioned a little bit as the regulatory agency, we are authorized to issue some export certificates. So if you have an unprocessed product, like a, oh, my time's up. If you have an unprocessed product, we will issue the phytosanitary certificates like raw blueberries, or I guess we should say fresh blueberries or um, raw or plain grass seed, those kinds of things. Also, if it's a processed product, we will issue the certificates of health or free sale. We, we also issue um, country of origin certificates if we license the food processor. So it's great to have more resources for that. I know there are several partners that offer those. And then um, just to mention, if anybody out there is bumping into regulatory stuff um, with the new Decree 248, in China, we are issuing a letter and we will we can help a little bit with some of those conversations, but that's probably the newest one that we're working on and, and try to respond to for our companies. Um, just to reiterate, we're here as a resource. We connect to other resources to help food and ag companies. And that's, um, we're excited to be here and complement the resources that so many other partners have. Okay, thank you very much, Teresa, I appreciate it. Um, just fun facts, 90% uh, of the global blueberries started in Oregon, somewhere about 90%. So you don't think we have a footprint, we have a huge footprint. So I just wanna you know, say thank you very much for that. Uh, Jim Newton from Small Business Administration, uh, tremendous amount of programs available um, that work up and down the different altitudes of the company sizes and, and the key programs. But you know, their job is to help, not the Boeings of the world, their job is to help the small to medium-sized companies really focus on getting those resources and the funds and the different programs and the insurances and things like that. Uh, doing business abroad is scary and having friends in low places and high places is a critical part of this uh, story that we tell here. And, and Jim has been a huge advocate for what my little company has been doing around the world. So I wanna pass it off to Jim Newton from Small Business. Dang. Here we go. I'm going to share my screen and discuss the export financing programs that SBA offers through its Office of International Trade. Uh, I am one of 21 international trade finance specialists across the country. I happen to have the good fortune of uh, calling on Oregon, Southwest Washington, Southern Idaho, Northern Nevada, Hawaii, Guam, and the Northern Marianas. So I, I've got a, quite an expanse of water out there. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, present to you uh, what SBA's Office of International Trade uh, wants to be able to deliver to you as a small business here in Oregon. Uh, in terms of providing you the capital you need to expand into overseas markets, utilizing a 90% guarantee, full faith and credit US government. And these are just examples of different types of companies that we have supported with our guarantee programs. 
And I might note this applies to companies that are selling to a third party here in the US, possibly a manufacturer of an end product that incorporates your product or services and then sends it into the export market. You too are eligible uh, for use of the export guarantee programs from SBA. These are the three programs. One applies primarily to export market development is almost a natural extension of the step grant program offered through the state of Oregon as uh, Alexa was speaking to. And the second to fulfill export orders. This is a true transactionally driven program. And then finally, a program uh, to expand export capacity to improve your competitive position internationally. The first program I wanna walk through, Export Express, as I say, primarily for export market development, loans up to $500,000, but it can also be used for transactional purposes. It uh, can be used to essentially acquire inventory, pay labor, and uh, allow you to offer credit terms to your foreign buyers. It also allows you to issue standby letters of credit as needed for bid and performance bonds and for advanced payment guarantees, as well as, the, and I might note, this is the Swiss Army knife of export financing. Uh, so you can actually use it to purchase property as well, both equipment and real estate to uh, improve your production capacity. The second export working capital guarantee program, EWCP, is what I consider to be our greatest value added because uh, this allows loans up to $5 million to finance specific transactions, export transactions, both single transactions and multiple contracts under a revolving line of credit. It's usually done on a short-term basis, typically one year, but can go out to three years. Proceeds can be used to finance export orders, inventory, materials, labor, other production costs. It can also be, and that's all done on a pre-shipment basis, but it can also be used on a post-shipment basis uh, to uh, essentially be able to offer sales terms to your foreign buyers, improve your competitive position, and uh, carry those foreign accounts receivable to collection. Quite often we'll call on XM Bank to provide their export credit insurance in conjunction uh, with that post-shipment support, but it's uh, to carry you from essentially start to, to finish in your export sales. And then uh, it can be used as well for insurance and freight costs, as well as bank fees related to the transaction. And finally, you can use it to issue standby letters of credit as bid and performance bonds or advanced payment guarantees similar to Export Express, and under that program, you can literally issue that standby with only 25% collateral cover, essentially 25% cash collateral, as opposed to having to 100% collateralize the issuance of the standby. International trade loan program, loans up to $5 million. This is the one to try and increase, not just try to increase your export capacity and it allows you to purchase uh, machinery and equipment as needed. Uh, my timer's going off, so I'll step it up here as well. It, to it, to uh, purchase machinery and equipment, uh, also for retooling purposes, if you do have to meet foreign product standards or licensing, uh, as Alexa was alluding to, and then permanent working capital is needed to carry a, a higher level of export sales on an ongoing basis or to acquire or build a large, a larger facility. And those loans actually go out 25 years. So recapping real quick, uh, Export Express averaged around 262,000 historically, but loans up to 500,000, 90% guarantee on the first 350,000, and then 75% on loans from, from 350 to 500. And these are done both under lines of credit and term loans. Export working capital strictly is a revolving line of credit. Loans just, or average loans, just under $2 million, but up to 5 million, uh, and it's a 90% guarantee across the board. International trade loan, also up to $5 million with an average loan size of around 1.5 million. These are term loans for plant and equipment or permanent working capital. 
and there's my sayonara and uh, how you can get in touch with me. And I really do encourage you to, to get in touch as far as sending an email or give me a call. Be glad to discuss individual situations on any transactions you're currently looking at. Thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing at this point. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Jim, very much. Uh, what, what's fun about this forum is that we have a whole bunch of talented federal and state government uh, people and their programs, um, but how does that dwell down to companies? And so uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Stephen White from Bob's Red Mill. Um, he's a member of the District, District Export Council and uh, a proud exporter. Uh, there are some companies that, that had huge issues of, uh, with the COVID environment. Then, then there's other companies that had huge issues the other way because there were so many people that decided they wanted to start uh, cooking their own bread and things like that, that, that uh, their company actually expanded during the, expand, the, the constriction of the rest of the country. So I wanna pass on how ki you know, kind that uh, Steve could join us and Stephen could join us in this, but, but he's also a, a dedicated uh, user of the embassies and many of the Commerce Department and Ag Department people. So tag your it, Stephen, uh, fire away. Thank you so much, Russ. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and Russ's point, um, absolutely. We're a, you know, a customer of the services and then on the Dec Export Council, definitely uh, helping other companies with it as well. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for a while, over 20 years exporting in some form or another. We've been doing it to over 60 countries direct. You can find our products in 120 different countries, um, one way or the other, uh, indirect or direct. And still go to, uh, I use the commercial services, use the Department of Ag all the time. Uh, just reached out to Teresa I think it was a couple weeks ago on China Decree 248 to get some more clarification from her understanding. Excellent resource there. Um, we we kind of look at it as two different things that I really like to use the services for, both commercial services and Department of Ag. One is obviously if we have an issue or a problem, and you know they're probably seeing that from multiple companies, and they can guide you a little bit in that process. So that's been extremely helpful. On the problem side as well, sometimes you're getting one story from your distributor, possibly an intermediary, a broker or something like that, and you need kind of a, a independent third party. And their contacts on the ground at the embassies really fill that for you. You know they're not um, they're not going to steer you wrong uh, one way or the other, going to kind of shoot straight with it. So um, using those contacts, using those um, services that are available have been extremely beneficial to us. And that's on the, the problem side. On more of a positive side, uh, we've definitely reached out and gotten the contacts to give us information on what's going on in the ground, how's the market looking. Obviously, we do food. One of the things I hear, which everyone who exports here is, oh, no, it's different here. It's different in Korea. It's different in the Middle East. It's different in wherever else you may be. And while that is true, um, there's a lot more similarities than, than, than differences in some, in some ways. But we do like to get that local information. Maybe it's local data, local um, uh, perspective, maybe it's some local information that we don't have as easy access to. So definitely reaching out to the U.S. Commercial Services uh, or Department of, uh, of Ag as well, uh, we can get that information. Whether it's GAN reporting or whether it's just actually speaking with somebody who's done report. Some people have done amazing reporting, have gotten amazing reporting from the UAE, um, you know, on organic foods and how they're growing and what's trending and things like that. And the local people were definitely benefiting from that local perspective. Uh, but then we're bringing it in with our knowledge and our, uh, you know, U.S.-based perspective and the data that we have. So you're kind of been, uh, melding them together, but it's it's definitely been extremely beneficial to us and something we use on a regular basis um, that I'm, I'm really proud to be part of the organization, but also uh, see a lot of benefit as a company. Thank you, Stephen. So now I get to put on my customer hat and uh, how I met the team with Commerce is I was flying into Turkey and I had no idea who to talk to, literally no one that I knew. So I actually emailed the embassy and said, hey, I'm a small business coming into Turkey. Uh, I'd love to have a chance to meet with somebody. And about three hours later, I got a ping from their, their anchor point for the commercial services inside the Turkish embassy. When are you coming in? We had dinner. He explained a whole bunch of what to do and critically what not to do in his country. And that local touch is such a critical part of this inside outside punch because they understand the culture. Many of them are, are native of their own country. 
and what to do and what not to do is such a valuable resource that way. Um, then you have, they rolled me back to the Portland office and said, there's an entire team here in your backyard that you should know about. And that relationship of being able to work hand in hand with the embassies became a critical part of our growth. We're a small company with a big technology footprint and everybody that's pretty much on this phone call has been involved in helping us grow and helping us expand our markets. Um, the other thing that happens is when you have a meeting in a foreign country, I invite the members of the US embassy to come join us and, and they'll sit with us in the meeting. And it's a little company with a very big friend at that point. And it also adds credibility to the equation. They've actually vetted me before they even had the meeting with this one. And uh, things like graft and, and intellectual property theft and things like that very quietly just dissipate when they know that it's a government to government uh, overview. And, and it would look poorly if, if the embassy was uh, you know, breached or embassy was impacted by this conversation. So I look at a critical part of our exp you know, expanding to you know, a dozen countries was part of the help that I could do. Um, another instance, I had a meeting uh, set up in a foreign country. I actually called the embassy and said, that's not far from the embassy. Will you go take a peek at their facility? And it was a garage. Their entire website was a sham. And they reported back to me very quickly uh, how that could be not a good thing for my company. And then some of the lovely programs that Commerce has, there's, there's a gold key program where you can actually uh, do a reconnaissance of a country. I want to move into Brazil. And these are the commodities or these are the items that I produce. Um, would you help me find companies that I should look at doing business with? Ultimately, they create, a, it's kind of a matchmaking thing, $800, $900, something in that range. I would spend that in phone calls trying to figure out who to talk to. And they would vet them and set the meetings up and in some instances attend the meetings with me. So I, I look at these just great resources uh, that that really, really help a small to medium sized company grow. And, and we are a, a great example of how we've had success in that. Um, in 2016, our company won the Presidential Export of Excellence Award that was given through Department of Commerce. And, and it was because of that lovely uh, working relationship we had with commerce back and forth and the ability to, to take our product abroad. Um, Job creations is a big thing and, and exports create jobs and they're higher paying jobs. And so I just wanna say as a customer of commerce, I, I think it's just incredibly good. They, they handpick their people both in the country and, and, and abroad and they take their job seriously and their job is to help move uh, US goods uh, successfully uh, abroad. And it's really been fun to, to be part of that. So what are the better kept secrets? This entire group is, you know, in my mind, one of the better kept secrets, and I believe we need to change that because it's such a valuable resource for, for companies abroad. 360 bucks to one is a pretty good odds. And, and they literally can work hand in hand with, you know, tailoring it to individual little companies, exactly what they need to be able to succeed. And then what not to do is every bit as powerful as what to do. And then so they help guide both in the state side and on, in the embassy side of what to do there. Um, we, you know, at the end of the day, you know, these really, really, these wonderful people focus on helping us work up succeed. And if the US market is successful, so is the country and they take it seriously and they they're handpicked and they're lovely people to work with. So I just uh, shout out to everybody on the on the uh, event today. Thank you. And I want to, you know, shout out to Sedcor. Um, I, I'm a member of SEDCOR as well, and I'm proud to be part of that. But I, I think the interface with SEDCOR and these, these services could actually help explode uh, U.S. goods in our region. And I just want to say thank you to SEDCOR and team for having this on. Uh, much appreciated, and I will bounce out at this point. So thank you, and back to the, the moderating team. Thank you, Russ. I think uh, with that Nice introduction or segue. I'll take over here. I'm Eric Anderson with SEDCOR, and uh, Russ is educating us an awful lot on the export uh, programs because his business is so active in this work. He's uh, um, keeping us keeping us busy learning about uh, export opportunities. Um, this is a reminder, we do have a Q&A function on uh, Zoom here. If people do have questions, I've got a couple here just to kind of start things with. Um, we do have a lot of uh, city reps and local economic development partners on the on the meeting here, and uh, they work with a bunch of different businesses, but particularly small businesses in their communities. And 
Um, I know the folks around the, the screen here have also worked with a variety of uh, businesses. And I thought I'd start with just, um, you know, maybe for, for folks I have been on calls with, with a specific business like um, maybe Teresa and Alexa, um, not to put you on the spot, but has there been a, you know, a recent project that you've been, a business or project that you've worked with that um, um, was kind of particularly notable to you, that a business that uh, may not have been an export um, before and had a unique opportunity and now is a, uh, um, you know, a champion for the export opportunity and one of those companies that's representing the 20% of jobs that are, uh, you know, from an export company. So, um, Alexa, maybe I'll start with you to see if you've got an example or two to share. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, one, uh, one of the companies that I was working with successfully, I was just chatting with Kelly about it yesterday, a uh, small company up in Hood River, they uh, work in the firefighting arena and they came over to the Singapore Air Show with us, one of the projects we were doing. They carried on to Australia and uh, within months they had um, a million dollar deal, which then became a, a two million dollar deal. So, uh, and I had the pleasure of going up to visit the facility up in Hood River couple months ago and witnessed their expansion. They'd hired new employees. They'd taken out another part of their existing building. Um, they could see they were making things. There were, there were cars in the parking lot. It was, um, it was super exciting to see them grow from, you know, a little bit of seed money from our side and, and some help in various countries. So that's one example. That's great. Thank you, Alexa. How about you, Teresa? Well, I, I might pull an example that still is growing, but um, as Alexa had mentioned in her presentation in the past few years, we've had to do a lot of virtual activities. And one of the things that we've really had to do is find different ways of connecting people, companies with potential buyers. So early in the pandemic, we did a recipe promotion. So we sent ingredients from Oregon, a few other states, to Japan and worked with a chef who'd been to Oregon in the past and with one of our inbound trade missions. And we had her create all those, take all those ingredients and create two types of bentos, you know, the beautiful lunch boxes in Japan. And she did those in a video and then we shared the video out. And one of the products we included from Oregon was a hot sauce. And it was great because it showed how that sauce that we think in how we'd use it here could be adapted to go into a bento in Japan. And then later she exhibited at a trade show remotely and was able to get a distributor in market and that distributor started doing promotions. So it has started off very well. So we're excited about that and expecting it to grow, especially as the food service sector in Japan recovers and comes back. That's great. Thank you. We do have a question here from Patricia McCarthy. She's uh, asking what exports are doing about overcoming challenges with logistics and getting access to containers for exporting. Um, she hears that empty cold storage containers are being returned empty to Asia from some of uh, her other food trading exporters on the West Coast. Anybody care to jump on that one? I know that uh, for Bob's, um, we're having, obviously everyone is paying more than they were 12 months ago. That's just a fact. Um, what we're trying to do is be as uh, diligent as we can to look at different ports. We have things going East Coast that had never gone East Coast in the past. Um, if you're sort of waiting around for it to get better, it will, but not tomorrow. So sometimes, you know, you get the, the waiting game where oh, they say it's going to be ready now. We've just kind of skipped past that and truck things to the East Coast for certain customers in the Middle East. Um, really tried to, if you work with one forwarder or broker, look at others, talk to them, think about different, different options, you know, a lot of them want to do obviously door to door where it's being picked up and taken all the way through. Maybe you got to find an intermediary warehouse where it stops off at the warehouse in Jersey, waits a day or two, and then gets picked up by another company and goes on its way. Um, and if you don't ask those questions and if you don't get out there and try to figure those things out, uh, you may find that they're just saying, oh, well, we just don't have an option for you if it's your current you know, forwarder or your current partner. So I do encourage everyone to really look at those, talk to different um, companies, do try different ports, and, and really take everything into account because 
you know, if I'm missing product off the shelf at Spinney's in Dubai, I could be losing thousands of dollars a week um, in lost, lost revenue for them. They're not happy with us, lost revenue for us. It just, it really spirals down. So people really need to think about those logistics costs. We air freighted eight pallets um, to Cutter uh, about a month ago, which is not great for flour, but you know, we're, we're looking at those options and working with the customers and, and doing what we can um, because some of your smaller countries will have a lot less options than they used to have. Uh, and sometimes you can, you can bounce off the larger ports, port like bounce off the UAE, Jebedali, something like that, and then go to your smaller country in the region. Um, you just gotta get creative and you really have to push things out there and ask, uh, ask your other partners in the same business who they're using, how's it going, you know, what's going on. That's, that's my two cents. And then as a member of the District Export Council, there's a, a folks that are uh, specialized in freight. And so, uh, you know, if there was appropriate questions, we could at least get them, you know, get it in front of them to help with that. Again, the Export Council's objective is to help uh, guide and, and give, you know, good information, at least on what path to take uh, and what not to take potentially. So I want to throw that in as well. Great, right, thank you. Got another question here from Abishan, our team here at the SEDCOR. Um, we like to talk about how uh, we thought supply chains were cool before everybody else did the last uh, several months. We were talking about them here as an opportunity in our region. Um, and we've certainly seen the uncertainty with respect to um, you know, foreign supply over the last few years. So we're actually actively working to localize supply chains in the US and we're trying to do our part here in the Valley as well. Um, do any of your organizations have new or emerging programs that our local companies should know about that might give them an advantage in capturing international markets? I think uh, Jim, Jim Newton's uh, entire portfolio would help that. And then Kelly was gonna jump in, but the SBA, that, that really is if in a nutshell, what their function in life is, is how to take US goods and, and through small business, push it forward. And right. a partner that we work with uh, locally uh, is OMEP, um, and they offer uh, Oregon Manufacturing Extension Program. They offer a supplier identification support on a local level. Um, that OMEP is, a, is partly supported through a commerce agency, uh, NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and they, if it can't be found locally through uh, the MIR program at NIST, they do supplier identification nationally. So that's part, one part, you know, when you talk about reshoring and supply chain, there's different elements to it. Um, an agency of commerce is um, Select USA. So it's specifically about inbound um, investment support. And within that is reshoring support. So um, they have amazing data and um, counsel that they can throw at this and, and then, you know, as part of Alexa's team and, and their, their portfolio, they have uh, investment specialists that help with that, those business needs. So she could speak better to that piece of it than, than I can. Yeah, I was going to chime in. We, we did uh, recently stand up a new program called the Small Business Sustainability Fund, and this is a super secretive program that um, we don't often get the word out on. Um, it's not a lot of funding, but if a, if a business is looking for, you know, anywhere up to 20 to 50,000, somewhere in there, um, to maybe procure a new piece of equipment that could help them with international production of uh, their product, that kind of thing. Um, it really helps with the onshoring and, and helping to be competitive internationally as well as domestically. So there are finance programs available through Business Oregon. That's kind of the short end of it. So keep this in mind. And uh, I will weigh in that SBA's financing support for indirect exporters certainly applies to supply chain uh, situations uh, where, uh, or whether it's Oregon companies uh, who are in need of additional support to arrange financing to be able to sell to third-party buyers here in the U.S. as part of their supply chain, we can certainly help support that. And we do recognize that there is increased cost involved in logistics throughout, throughout the whole system. So 
we try to make allowance for that in the financing process. Great, thank you. And, and Kelly, I appreciate the, the reference to Select USA as well, because we're working with Business Oregon um, to be part of the Select USA Oregon presence uh, back live in the Metro DC area this year. So um, uh, we've got folks on the, on the call that are interested in uh, learning more about uh, those opportunities and what, you know, giving us a laundry list of things we should be researching while we're there. We're happy to do that too. Fantastic. Then just a, a plug on that. This is the largest uh, foreign direct investment event in the United States. Um, and there are thousands of foreign businesses, um, delegates, government officials that come to Washington, D.C. for this multi-day event. So it's really a chance to showcase your, your needs work through Eric and team Business Oregon, who will be there um, if you can't physically make it uh, to represent what you're what you're looking for, who you want to attract. Thank you for mentioning that, Eric. Yeah, and that's, you know, I know for us in our role, that actually makes it a, a, a relatively easy conversation to start, at least when it comes to, uh, you know, one industry, at least around agriculture, because, um, you know, we're there, um, talking with uh, producers from all over the world. And, and um, um, you know, there's a common language there as far as, you know, supply chain and, and you know, what kinds of products were, uh, uh, we, we, we grow in this region where there are opportunities to grow others, um, you know, where there's uh, food processing opportunities to process what they're growing elsewhere. So um, it's, those are always exciting conversations to have. Um, also you learn quite a bit what's going on in the world too. Um, I just said, and speaking of the food thing, I guess I would just I looked at who's on the call. We do have some CDB oil and um, wine industry. I think folks are probably familiar with uh, the Willamette Valley and our wines and uh, maybe even some hops that are grown. But for wine producers, beer producers, CDB oil, other businesses, how, um, I, you know, anecdotally, when I was in Sweden a couple of years ago, we went to a restaurant and the west of Sweden that I guess there's a buyer there, um, wine buyer who just loves Oregon wines. Um, and it was nice to see a restaurant literally full of uh, in their uh, wine selection of uh, very familiar, surprisingly familiar names. See Ken Wright and Maison Noir and some of those other ones pop up in a, a faraway place was a real thrill. And they knew how to pronounce Willamette and uh, Oregon, I always point out. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, when you have sm some of those smaller businesses, they're a little bit daunted about some of the extra paperwork involved with uh, wine, beer, um, CDB, et cetera. Any thoughts on, on their resources to kind of get them to that point where they're comfortable looking at export? Well, I think that part of the reason you saw some wine in Sweden is a, the Oregon Wine Board also has access to funds and works. We work closely to complement their efforts. But that's one of their strategic region is in the northern part of Europe, as well as a few key countries in Asia and Canada. So both um, wine companies have that second resource and we partner with the wine board to help bring that to companies and with Wasada. So there's, there's kind of a smorgasbord of resources out there for all of our companies. And that's one of the things if I'm talking to a beer company that's something I can definitely highlight is if you're, you've got beer, we've also got the, the Brewers Association and, and what we're doing and kind of help them tap into all their opportunities. Uh -huh. CBD is a uh, little more difficult. My, my colleague has produced an Oregon wine guide, uh, exporter guide that walks through, for those just getting started, some of the considerations, maybe they're not a member of the Oregon Wine Board or, or whatnot. Um, so th that council is available, it's certainly support that our teams and working through the Foreign Agriculture Service overseas are, are used to. So uh, worthwhile to reach out. There's no brand like Oregon, you know, some of these unique uh, varietals we have here um, and lots of opportunity. I will say, so this is kind of a first release uh, um, public statement that um, heretofore we have not been able to support um, CBD related um, products and that has changed. 
So some of the traditional service that um, Russ and Steve have referred to, the partner matchmaking, business intelligence, we are now um, authorized to step into that space. Um, however, there are still um, a, a number of hurdles that are evolving, regulatory hurdles um, on the US side, the Customs and Border Protection, um, and then what is uh, how it can be imported to foreign countries. Um, there's a huge range of what's allowed and what's not allowed. So it's still, um, I, I don't know, Wild West is the, maybe the wrong, the wrong term, but it's definitely evolving. But if there are companies in that space that, that want to knock on our door for some assistance, um, please do reach out. That's great to know. Thank you. And we may have uh, uh, one of our participants doing just that, uh, seeing who's on the call here. Um, one last call for any Q and A uh, from the from the the Zoom audience here, and if not, uh, I do want to I do want to say on that topic though I've done my share of exporting uh, Oregon made aquavit to Sweden um, for the relatives there, so it's a little bit like bringing poles to the castle, but um, uh, and it goes over very well. So it's a, uh, very exotic for, for importing their aquavit from the U.S. from the Willamette Valley here. Um, well, thank you everybody for your participation today, Russ. I want to, certainly want to thank you first and foremost for bringing this opportunity to said core and um, Kelly and Alexa and Jim and Steven and Teresa. Thank you for uh, all of your engagement today and enthusiasm about uh, the export opportunity. Um, you know, one thing we have learned is that the world has gotten a lot smaller in the last couple of years, and I think. Uh, um, you know, this is the kind of opportunity for businesses that, uh, um, you know, maybe even be stronger now than it was a couple of years ago as, as people have been home researching more, figuring out what to do when they, uh, um, you know, during COVID uh, pandemics and, and such things. Um, also want to thank uh, our sponsor, Pacific Power. Um, Cooper, thank you for your engagement in this and your sponsorship uh, um, of, of our uh, business forum. Um, there will be some additional training available from uh, this uh, group of folks in the future. So uh, for, fo for people that did register, whether they're on the call or not, they'll be getting additional information. And for folks that are listening to this later, uh, that will be posted on our website as well. Um, and so keep an eye out in the next few days for getting that information uh, in a post-event email. Um, you can keep track of all of our SEDCOR events um, by following us on social media or checking the SEDCOR.com website. And our Friday email, we tend to send a, a full one on Friday afternoons just to give you something to read over the weekend um, of what's going on in SEDCOR's world and some of our partners um, and things that are happening, hopefully of interest to local businesses. Um, our next event will be uh, held in person, um, the March Economic Forum. It's a state of the County, uh, state of Marion County, and it's going to be at the um, Salem Convention Center on March 9th. And um, registration is open right now on our website and will be uh, open for the next couple of weeks uh, through March 4th, which I guess isn't that far off. It seems like it should be much farther off. Um, but uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, getting to see people in person and seeing if everybody still has a lower part of their face, which is uh, kind of exciting. <laughs> And um, with that, I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us today. Once again, thank you to the Zoom uh, call and um, look forward to catching up with you in the future.